Hey guys, good evening and welcome to the Long Course Execution Tips and Tricks. I am super excited about the information that I have to share with you this evening. My intent here is to help you produce your best results and enjoy the process when you are racing long course races. My name is John Mayfield. I am a full-time triathlon coach. I am certified by USA Triathlon at level two, as well as Ironman U, and I have had the privilege of coaching hundreds of athletes from first-timers to professionals and everyone in between. Uh, what I want to do again this evening is share what I've learned as a coach, uh, also as an athlete, to help you produce your best race results and enjoy the race experience as best you can. Long course racing really is something special. Uh, you put a lot of work, a lot of investment into this, and helping you execute is going to help produce your best results and enjoy that process as much as possible. So fitness determines your potential, but execution determines your finish. And that's really the crux of what we're going to be dis discussing here this evening. You've trained hundreds of hours. You have massive fitness and race potential, but disappointing race results are most often not inadequate training, but poor execution. You can have professional athlete level race potential, but it's all for naught if you do not execute. So again, that's what we're looking to do here this evening is not necessarily improve your fitness, but improve your race day execution. So going to move through uh, a lot of these things pretty, pretty quick here. Uh, we're going to be discussing pre-race. So these are just things that we do uh, really year round, regardless of, of when, when race day is. Uh, we're going to discuss briefly the taper as we head into race day, some logistics, and then we're going to hit swim, bike, run, and transition. And then we're going to get into what I'm referring to as the, the quadfecta of, of race execution, which is going to be pacing, nutrition, hydration, and cooling. If you can nail those four things, you are going to be setting PRs, you are going to be having a great race day and really enjoying the race experience. So those are the four things that I really want to focus in on here this evening and help you uh, really dial in. And, and part of that is, is race rehearsals. And then I would be remiss if we didn't at least briefly hit on the finish line. So again, there's a whole bunch to these. We could talk uh, for, for an hour on each one of these topics, but uh, just I want to hit kind of at a high level these things that, that all athletes should be doing on a regular basis. And the first thing uh, I want to hit on is strength training. So there's really two main intents to strength training for triathletes. First is, is increasing power. So the stronger the muscles is the more power is going to produce. The more power that muscle produces, the faster we're going to swim, bike, and run, which is which is really uh, the overall objective. Um, then the second is injury prevention. So the stronger those muscles are, the stronger the bones are, which that comes along with strength training, the soft tissue, all of that, the stronger all of that is, the more resistant to injury you are going to be. So the more consistently you can train, the stronger you're going to become race day. So strength training uh, is incredibly important. It also increases muscular endurance, which is going to make you more resistant to cramping, which uh, that is is often a, a thing long course athletes will experience. They, they blame it on other things like dehydration or, or uh, lack of electrolytes, but oftentimes it is a, a lack of muscular endurance from that specific muscle that is fatiguing and going into a cramp. So uh, we want to work the big muscles, um, the quads, the hamstrings, the glutes, those power producers, but then also all those those really small muscle groups uh, as well that, that have a tendency to fatigue or have a tendency to, to be prone to injury. Uh, next is rehab and recovery. Obviously, this is a very important component to your training. What we're doing in our training is breaking down the body. What we're doing in recovery is aiding the body in, um, in, in coming back, coming back stronger, coming back more fit. So you can't simply just do the training. Uh, it's, it's really the training and the opposite side of that equation is the recovery uh, and the rehab that you're doing that is going to allow you to do that next training session to recover from all prior training, to, to convert all of that prior training into adaptation and fitness. Next is nutrition. So we're going to talk more about your, your race day nutrition uh, here in a bit, pretty extensively, but this is really more of your, your day-to-day -day nutrition, your, your diet, so to speak. Um, 
really what we're looking to do here is is adequately fuel both our training sessions and then fuel the recovery. So again, this is this is what uh, this is the energy that is going to get us through those training sessions. This is the the protein and the other macros that are going to fuel the body to to come back stronger. Injury mitigation, um, regardless of, of what you do, uh, how, how appropriate your, your training level, your training load, your training intensities, your recovery, uh, when you train as, as many hours and as many miles as you do as a long course triathlete, you are going to come up against uh, the, the potential for, for injury. You're going to have little pains. You're going to have some niggles here and there. Uh, it's, it's mitigating those and how you respond to those that really is going to determine the long-term impact of those. So it is critical that when you um, begin to feel something, when, when something begins to hurt or when something uh, begins to feel a little bit off, don't neglect that. Don't ignore it. Don't assume it's going to go away. Be active in mitigating your injury risk. So uh, it's it's uh, doing the things that we already talked about, things like foam rolling, massage, recovery boots, all those kinds of things. Um, but if uh, a, a pain or discomfort, something that feels off, doesn't get better within a few days, seek professional help, whether it be a, a PT, a chiropractor, something like that, uh, someone who can um, help you work through that uh, and get you back to, to full speed so that you can train consistently. Sleep is critical, uh, and that can be a bit difficult for for us. Many of us are uh, have have demanding jobs, families, other obligations, uh, and then we get in uh, a, a large amount of training as well. We we stay up late, uh, we get up early, but uh, it is important that we get sufficient sleep. So uh, again, this is where uh, most of the adaptation occurs. This is where most of the recovery occurs. So it's about translating all that training into fitness and race readiness. And then just uh, something to throw out, um, I offer course info, tips and tricks, and Q&A webinars into the vast majority of Ironman and Ironman 70.3 events. So uh, we, we cover uh, the course, the course elevations, uh, how to best execute, um, and things like that. So uh, I put those up in the Facebook groups. Uh, I can also get you on the mailing list if you're interested in checking out uh, one of those webinars. All right, on to the taper. So the taper speaks to a gradual reduction in training volume. Uh, it is it is important that we maintain or even increase the amount of intensity that we are doing in training as we are going through that gradual reduction in training volume. Uh, the taper should also be discipline independent. So the taper is not necessarily, say, one week, 10 days, two weeks out from race day. It's really going to depend on several variables um, and it's going to, to depend on the, the race distance, your strengths and weaknesses within the swim, bike and run, your ability to absorb and make adaptations from training. Um, but really, the taper is about recovery and adaptation, not necessarily increasing fitness. So uh, the mistakes that we often see is, is a sudden decrease in training volume and then neglecting that intensity. So make sure that uh, make sure that, that it is that gradual reduction and we're maintaining or even increasing the amount of intensity in those final training sessions. Uh, and this is something just to keep in mind. Training takes approximately 10 to 14 days to be converted into an adaptation, to be converted into fitness or race readiness. So oftentimes these sessions we are doing are within that um, within that time period. So again, these sessions are not necessarily making us more fit. It's about uh, recovery, hormone production, and other things that are going to prepare us for race day. Okay, just quickly, uh, a couple logistical things to keep in mind and to consider. Uh, something that, that I'm kind of big on, uh, especially for long course racing is packing, uh, swimming, cycling, running, nutrition, recovery. There's a whole lot of things to bring. There are a whole lot of things that you can forget. Oftentimes when racing these long course races, uh, there is a certain amount of travel involved, uh, whether that's by car, by plane, um, there's a lot of things to pack for. So um, my, my suggestion here is to, to use checklist. Um, think about those things that you're using on a regular basis. What are those things that you always have with you uh, on your long sessions? Uh, think about the things that you're going to want to have. Make a checklist, 
That's going to make your packing quick and easy and low stress. Uh, once that checklist is completely checked off, uh, you can rest assured that you've got everything that you need and you're not forgetting anything. Uh, travel, uh, book plans well in advance uh, and then travel early. Get to the race site as, as early as feasible. Um, and then even, even things like getting to the airport early if you're traveling. Uh, just something to note if you're traveling with a bike, most airlines will require at least an hour um, before takeoff to, to be dropping your bike. I would recommend probably at least 90 minutes, if not two hours in advance. Uh, so it has plenty of time to go through TSA. You can request to, um, observe as they are going through, uh, your, your bike box, bike bag. Um, it will be inspected by TSA. I would suggest, um, being there and, and seeing it just, uh, I've seen too many things go missing or things damaged. Um, so I would recommend, uh, that as well, if you are flying, uh, with your bike. And then once you arrive, check out the course. Uh, the intent here is to have no surprises on race day. We want to know exactly what it is that we're in store for so we can have a plan and then we can execute that plan without any unexpected, uh, quote unquote, bumps in the road. Uh, so those are the kind of things that you're looking for. Uh, what is the road quality? Uh, where and in, in, in what do uh, the climbs look like? What do the descents look like? Are there sharp turns uh, going into a climb or coming out of a descent? Where are the aid stations? Um, where is there shade? Where is there sun exposure? Where is it likely uh, to, to be windy or which direction is the prevailing wind coming from? All of those things can help you prepare, prepare for race day and then execute better in your race. And then, uh, of course, review the athlete guide. Um, even if you are a seasoned athlete, sometimes there's just one or two things within that athlete guide that can really make a difference. Something that's uh, a little out of the norm um, that is going to make the, the few minutes reviewing that athlete guide very worthwhile. All right, so now we're going to hit on swim, bike, run, transition. Um, we're still going to go through these relatively quickly. Uh, as, as I mentioned, I do those um, course info webinars. I get much more granular and, and specific uh, to each course. So uh, if you have uh, questions or want information specific to the race that you're going to be doing, uh, that's, again, what I'm going to do in those webinars. It'll, it'll be specific to each race and what you're uh, going to encounter on those swim, bike, run, and, and transition. But here, I um, want to give just, again, some, some high-level tips uh, so far as execution, swim, biking, running, uh, and, and transition. So on the swim, uh, be cognizant of your goggle selection. The biggest thing here is which way is the course oriented? Uh, most, uh, if not all now, um, courses, uh, races begin early morning. The sun is going to be rising there in the east. So what does that mean for you? Uh, which which direction does the course go? Which which side do you breathe to? Um, which, uh, where and when are you going to be susceptible to the sunrise? If, if you don't have... Um, Adequate eye protection, it's going to be very difficult to, to sight if that sun uh, is, is there in your line of sight blocking you from having um, good sighting cues. Uh, before the race starts, make sure that you're queuing appropriately. Um, the vast majority of races now are self-seated uh, rolling starts where you will line up according to your expected swim time. Um, uh, queuing appropriately is going to um, set you up for a good race. It's going to put you with swimmers that are of, of a like ability. Uh, you're going to uh, reap the benefits of the draft when you are, are swimming with athletes that are swimming approximately uh, the same pace as you. It's going to reduce the amount of impact uh, that you have and, again, help you uh, get off to a great start. Now, this is a, a great tip. This is one of my favorites. Uh, this was um, told to me years ago by, by one of my good buddies, Jeff Rains. Um, it is prime the wetsuit. This is specific to, um, especially a cold water swim. Uh, so the way a wetsuit works is again, it's a wetsuit. It's not a dry suit. Um, the way those wetsuits work is by allowing a thin layer of water, uh, between that suit and your body, your body temperature is then going to warm that water. And that is what is going to, to keep you warm. So, uh, what you don't want to do is jump into that cold water allow that cold water into your suit and then have to um, use your body heat to warm that thin layer of, of water. Uh, so what you can do by priming your wetsuit is take water with you, room temperature, lukewarm, uh, take that with you down to the swim start and pour that water 
inside your suit prior to getting into that cold water. Um, yes, peeing will work. Uh, that's a great trick uh, for for priming the the bottom half of your wetsuit. But um, your core temperature uh, in your in your core uh, is really what is going to be most important to to preserve. So by pouring that water down the neck, down the back, uh, getting as much of that. Um, inside of the suit wet with uh, lukewarm room temperature water, uh, the better. So then when you do jump into uh, that cold water, your body has already had a chance to warm that water up. Uh, the wetsuit is already wet inside and it is going to uh, keep you warmer. Um, it is, and it's going to keep you warm from the very beginning as opposed to uh, actually sucking some, some body heat out uh, in the process of, of warming that water. So again, that's going to be more specific to your cold water swims. Um, my rule of thumb is somewhere if, uh, the water temperature is, is maybe in the sixties, uh, that's kind of where, um, I begin to, to get cold in, in water and I will use that trick sixties, uh, or excuse me, seventies and above. Um, not so much concerned about that, but, uh, yeah, once the water gets a little bit colder, um, that's a great trick. Uh, also, adjust your stroke for the conditions. This is something I see two athletes often neglecting. They have one swim stroke and they are going to apply that swim stroke regardless of the conditions of, of their swim. Basically, what they do in the pool is what they're going to do on, on race day. And the closer the conditions are to the swimming pool, the better that is, uh, the, the finer that's that's going to work. So um, if you are swimming in in very calm, very still water with, with no current, no chop, no wind, waves, um, then exactly what you do in the pool is going to be just fine. Uh, typically your, your down river swims, uh, when you're swimming with the current kind of same thing, uh, you just go along with it. You can have a nice long, um, steady stroke, uh, with big, strong pools, um, under the water. Those are going to work fantastic, but really where you need to make modifications and adjustments to your stroke is, is when you are, are swimming in some rough conditions. Um, whether that be, uh, swimming in, in a current. So if you're swimming against a current, maybe swimming upstream, um, maybe something like Ironman Florida, where you've got some, some tight changes, maybe even some small rip currents in there, um, or if the water is particularly choppy or, or wavy. Um, in these cases, you are going to have to increase the stroke rate, depending on, on what your default um, rate is. But um, if you've got a nice, long, pretty, uh, kind of that quintessential pool swimmer stroke, you're actually going to be swimming backwards at times if, if that current or those waves are strong enough. So what you want to do here in these cases, if you're swimming um, across a current or something like that, increase the stroke rate to where you're constantly having a, a pool against the water that is going to help you offset the effects of that moving water. So adjust for the conditions that you're in. Obviously, this is going to be a little bit different based on every venue, every day even this can change, but uh, just be aware that um, it may be necessary to adjust uh, your stroke as you are moving through those conditions. And then break the course into sections. This is uh, kind of spoiler alert. I'm going to be making this tip for swim, bike, and run. Um, how do you eat the elephant one bite at a time? Long course racing is, is a long way. It's a long day for me psychologically. It helps in, in my execution and even my mental management of the day if I break the course into sections. So again, this is going to be a little bit different in every venue. Um, but is it an out and back course? Are there some, uh, 90 degree turns, something like that? Is it a two loop course? If so, break that course down into section and just attack each section one at a time. Once you've achieved one, you move on to the next, onto the next and so forth from the start line all the way to, to the finish line that can help you with your execution, help you with your mental game. And again, help you produce your best results. All right, moving on to transition. So uh, I'm going to wrap T1 and T2 here here together. Again, not getting real specific here tonight. I will get more specific on those individual race webinars. But uh, basically for T1 and T2, regardless of, of where you're racing, it's important to know your location and the process. So whether you're racing 70.3 or Ironman, obviously most of those races have a very different process. Uh, your 70.3 is more traditional. Uh, everything is set up there. Uh, at your rack, whereas most of the Ironman races uh, utilize change tents, gear bags, those kinds of things. So um, 
Again, all those uh, webinars I do, I go into a lot of detail as to exactly how that works, but know the process of your transition um, and then know your location. So where are those gear bags dropped at an Ironman event? Um, where is your bike on the rack? Being able to find those quickly and easily uh, is, is going to be important in having effective, efficient transitions. Be efficient in what you do. So uh, this speaks to knowing exactly what your transition protocol is. What are those things that you're going to do um, and do them efficiently, do them well. We don't want to waste time uh, there in transition. Pack minimally. So uh, especially given the fact that space either in that gear bag or space there below the bike is limited, uh, it's important to pack minimally. This is also part of being efficient. We want to only have those things there that we are going to, to use. So be uh, aware and cognizant of that when planning out and practicing your transitions. Speaking of, Practice those transitions in advance. A lot of times, especially seasoned athletes, will just assume I've been doing this for a long time. I know exactly what I'm doing, um, but a little bit of practice can go a long way. So again, what we want to do is know exactly what it is that we are going to do in transition and then be able to execute those quickly and easily. And the more times we practice it, the more we know what it is, the less likely we are to forget uh, anything like that. So um, I, I've been racing long course races for, for more than a decade. Um, and uh, one of my last races, I actually forgot to put my helmet on leaving transition. So it, it can happen to, to anyone. Um, and, and so practice, be efficient, know exactly what it is that you do in transition and then do that um, quickly. Learn to steer your bike by the saddle. Um, so this is something, it, it looks kind of cool. Um, it, it, it can uh, be, be a dividing line between new and seasoned triathletes, um, but it's more about than just looking cool. The biggest thing it's going to do is move you from, from steering with the bars, placing you in the area of, of your pedals, putting you back behind the bike. So you can even see here, um, this athlete in the picture, is, is holding on to the, the stem or the handlebars to steer, um, which is actually quite difficult to steer the bike in that way, especially when running. And then you're also right there in the way of, of where the pedals are going to be. So um, take just a few minutes to learn how to steer your bike by the saddle. It's actually very easy to learn. Just go on the driveway, go down the sidewalk, spend a few minutes mastering this skill, and you're actually going to be able to move through transition quicker. Uh, you're going to be able to get real skinny. You can actually get behind the bike if needed. If, if there's um, some traffic getting through the racks or getting out there to the mountain line, you're going to move uh, just, just quicker and more efficiently um, and not have to worry about tripping over uh, your pedals by uh, steering with um, the saddle. And then likewise, learn the flying mount or dismount. So I would say this one is a, a little bit less critical, but um, really can be advantageous. It's going to allow you uh, to not have to run through transition in your shoes. It is going to be a little bit quicker. Uh, it is going to be a little bit more efficient. Um, so practice on your trainer at first. Um, there's plenty of YouTube videos out there showing how to do this. Uh, you don't necessarily have to do the big sweeping moves that you see some of the, like the ITU athletes doing. Um, but learn how to get into your shoes, get out of your shoes on the, the dismount line. Um, that is going to help you on, on a race day. And then this is a great tip here. This is one of my favorites. I can't take credit for it. This was given to me by my friends at Precision Fuel and Hydration. Consider a go bottle. So we're gonna be talking about this more with nutrition and hydration, the electrolyte intake, but a go bottle um, is a bottle there in transition. Uh, for, for me, it's about uh, six ounces of water in T1. Uh, for T2, it's, it's more like eight, 10, 12 ounces of water. Um, I have a full serving of my nutrition in there, a full serving of electrolyte. So in T1, I'll just take that bottle, uh, chug down those six ounces of water pretty quick. That is going to get me started, get me um, going as far as my hydration, my nutrition, and my electrolytes going. Uh, depending on the race distance, it's been somewhere 30, 60 minutes or so that I've gone without taking in nutrition while I was out there swimming. I was burning calories. I was sweating, going through electrolytes. So that go bottle is just a little bit of a primer as I begin the bike uh, to get started on replenishing that and then starting my, my protocols that we're going to be discussing here in a minute. Likewise, in T2, 
as you come in, I'll put on my shoes, hat, all that kind of stuff. I will grab that bottle. I'll actually go with it. So it kind of lives up to its name as a go bottle, carry that bottle out there. And uh, again, this one, I'll have a little bit more. Um, I might take it all in as, as I'm exiting transition. I may uh, kind of nurse it through the first uh, quarter mile, half mile, uh, whatever the case may be, depending on how my stomach is feeling, all that. Um, but again, what we're looking to do there is just get, um, get all those primed hydration, nutrition, electrolytes as we uh, start out there on the run. So that that has been a, a great tip. I've, I've uh, really enjoyed implementing that into my transition strategy. So thanks to those guys for that tip. All right, moving out onto the bike. Um, the bike sets up the run. So therefore execution is critical. So what we do on the bike really is going to manifest out there on the run course. Uh, this is where we, if we, um, if we over bike, if we under hydrate, under, uh, take in nutrition, any of those, that's really going to manifest on the run. So it is critical that we nail the bike execution, maybe not so much for the bike split itself, but we are not out there looking for great bike splits. We are out there looking for great race results. So execution on the bike is, is critical. So, uh, settle in, uh, that, that's something oftentimes we'll see athletes going too hard, too quick out of transition. Sometimes the stomach can be a little off from the swim. Sometimes even, uh, your equilibrium can be a little bit off. Be patient and settle in, especially when racing Ironman, uh, you've got a long way to go out there on the bike, but even that 70.3 is, is long enough. So settle in, um, get your, uh, protocols kicked off, dial in your pacing, or, or at least get, get on, uh, your pacing, start to, um, work on hydration, nutrition, electrolytes, um, and then settle in, build in to pace throughout, um, the course, know the course. So we already mentioned this previously, uh, in those days leading into the race, it's, it's advised to go and put eyes on as much of that course as is possible so that you'll know exactly what you're in store for. And you can plan around that. You can execute around what it is that you're going to experience on race day. Uh, as I said, uh, I'm going to say this for the swim, bike and run, break the course into sections. So this is going to allow you to attack and execute, um, each section of the course, break it down, eat that elephant one bite at a time. So maybe, um, it's a multiple loop course. Maybe it's an out and back kind of a thing. Um, maybe there are hilly sections and flat sections, um, by breaking down that course into sections, it's again, going to allow you to, to attack it mentally and from a high level of execution fuel and hydrate strategically. So, um, you're going to have a protocol that is going to give you a certain amount of, of intake over, uh, the hours, over the miles. Um, but, but there can be things that can interfere with that. So, um, this is why we want to fuel and hydrate strategically. So if you've got a particularly challenging, particularly hilly section of, of the course coming up, go ahead and make sure that you are, uh, even a little bit ahead on your hydration, nutrition intake, because it may be difficult to, to stay up once you enter into, um, that hilly section. Maybe right now you're, you're riding a tailwind. Um, and you know, you're approaching a U-turn where that, that massive tailwind is, is quickly to become a headwind. It is going to become more difficult to take in your nutrition hydration once you, uh, are experiencing those, those adverse conditions. So, so fuel, uh, and hydrate st strategically in that case, uh, when you have the opportunity. So again, this is those times where knowledge is power. You can, uh, you know what you're in store for, so you can make those adjustments to, uh, your plan. Be patient on climbs and recover on downhills. So, uh, this is again, going to be very specific to, to courses. Uh, there are a lot of courses out there that don't have any climbs or any downhills. Uh, so this is going to be specific to those hillier courses. And again, it's going to vary greatly based on each individual, uh, your experience and your strength, uh, ascending and descending your, your bike handling skills, all those kinds of things. But as a rule, um, with what we are doing in triathlon, it's, um, it is a good idea to be conservative and patient on, on the climbs, um, and then to recover on the downhills. Now that doesn't mean, uh, don't apply any power going up and, and any power going down. Um, but, but especially, um, be careful not to overdo it. Um, and what we'll see oftentimes is, um, athletes will attack early on in the climb and then kind of fade as that climb goes on. Uh, the inverse of that is actually, uh, more advised. So, uh, be, be conservative in the beginning. And then as you begin to crest that hill, that is when you begin to increase your power output, which is going to help you crest and then get onto that downhill where again, you can apply, uh, power 
and then take advantage of gravity uh, taking you downhill. And then towards the end of that bike leg, begin to prepare for transition. So uh, kind of two things here. Um, I will do in preparation for, for transition is first, I will stop taking in, um, anything into my stomach 20 minutes or so, um, out. Uh, what I don't want to do is, is flood my stomach as I go into transition and start the run. I don't want, uh, food and water sloshing around in my stomach. That's going to be quite uncomfortable. So about 20 minutes out, I will stop, um, taking in, uh, any, any, um, anything into my stomach for those last 20 minutes. If um, I have a, a sensation of, of thirst, maybe it's just a rinse out. Um, maybe it's a little bit of water, but not a whole lot. Again, uh, just kind of giving my stomach the opportunity to settle down before starting the run. So what I'm going to do is make sure that um, throughout that whole process, throughout that whole bike leg, I'm staying up on my hydration and nutrition. And maybe as I begin to approach that 20 minute mark out from, from transition, it's, it's taking in uh, just a little bit more to get me through those final 20 minutes. Um, so making sure that I'm up on that and then uh, kind of riding those last 20 minutes, allowing the stomach uh, to, to settle. And then um, I'm going to begin to, to match my cadence on the bike to my cadence on the run. So, um, most, uh, are going to have a cadence somewhere around 180 steps per minute. Uh, that equates to, to, uh, 90 per foot. So what I'm going to do is, is begin to spin, uh, a little faster. Usually in a long course race, my cadence is somewhere in the neighborhood of 80 to 85. That's going to vary, uh, based on, uh, your individual, the course, all that. But, uh, for me, I'm going to increase my cadence, spin a little bit lighter gear, allow the legs to recover. And this is really probably more in the last five to 10 minutes, um, matching my cadence, uh, to that. So that, uh, when I come off the bike, I have that neurological effect. I have that muscle memory of, of what the, what it feels like to turn over to rate of, of 90 per minute. Uh, and then I will just automatically head into that 90 per minute cadence as I head out, um, of, of transition and onto the run. Speaking of, uh, kind of like the run, we want to take it easy in the beginning, settle in. Um, so oftentimes what I advise on, on a, a, uh, multi-loop course, uh, a lot of the courses we have are, are either two loops or three loops. Uh, for this purpose, I really like a three loop course. I know a lot of people, uh, get dizzy and, and don't like seeing the same things three times. Um, I really like a three loop course simply for this reason. What I will say is, is that first loop should be almost a, a forced restraint where you're, you're holding back, your body's wanting to go faster, but it's, it's a little bit of restraint, um, anywhere, uh, maybe it's 10, 15, maybe it's 30 seconds per mile slower than your goal pace, which you can feel, um, this is going to allow you, uh, to keep a lower heart rate. It's going to allow you to run faster later on. It's going to allow you to judge how the day is going. How is your stomach? How is, uh, how is your fueling? How is your energy level? All those things settle in. Don't go out too hard. Um, oftentimes we, we come out of transition just floating and all of a sudden it, it, you look down and you're running a minute per mile, two minutes per mile faster than, than what you would even think or should be running that can catch up to you very quickly. That can be very deceptive. Um, that, that oftentimes, unfortunately doesn't last as long as we would like it to. Um, so be conservative in the beginning of, of that race. So maybe it's the first third or so, maybe it's the first quarter, maybe it's even just the first mile or two really holding back to get a feel for what it is that you are experiencing and then build throughout to where, uh, that, that second loop is, is more, uh, kind of a, a natural run pace. And that last loop is you're just kind of letting it all hang out, burning, uh, burning it to, to the ground. Like the swim and bike, know the course, know what you're in store for, know where the climbs are, know where the aid stations are, know where the sunny parts are and the shade. All of that can actually uh, factor into to your execution plan and help you produce your best results. Break that course into sections and, and attack accordingly, um, especially now that uh, as this day has has uh, gotten kind of long, whether it be 70.3 or, or really long at Ironman, uh, sometimes just getting through that next section is, is really all you can afford to focus on. Uh, if you come out of uh, the first, you run the first quarter mile of an Ironman marathon and you think about the fact that you still have 26 miles to go, that's gonna be defeating and and, and is not going to uh, help you get through the rest of that day. But just get through that next section, whether it's just a, another mile, maybe it's the next aid station, maybe it's completing that first loop. Just get through that next section 
and that is really going to help uh, in your execution. Uh, like the bike, uh, fuel and hydrate strategically. So uh, take advantage of the course and make that work to your advantage. And then uh, th this isn't a hard and fast rule, but I think it's a good idea. Take something from every aid station. You, you've paid a whole lot of money to be in this race, so you might as well get your money's worth. But in the vast majority of cases, you can benefit from taking something from every aid station on the run. They're spread out approximately every mile. So for, for the fast people, this is, this is maybe every six minutes. For those at the back, maybe it's 10 to 15 minutes um, in between. But whether that be um, nutrition, water, ice, uh, a cold towel, a cold sponge, chances are it is going to be advantageous to take something from each aid station that you encounter. Because again, as we're going to talk about here in a few minutes, staying up on your hydration in your nutrition, in your cooling protocols are absolutely critical. That's what those aid stations are there for, to keep you fueled, to keep you hydrated, and to keep you cool. Take advantage of it. In, in the vast majority of events that, that we see, especially here in, in North America, um, they are on the warm sides where you're going to be uh, burning calories and sweating. Um, so taking in those are, are going to be pretty cool. So um, even if it's just a, a fresh uh, cold towel, maybe it's just a, a single uh, cup of water or maybe just a little bit of ice, um, that's fine. Do that. But chances are, it's going to be uh, a greater need and you're going to benefit from, again, taking something from, from every aid station. And there, as I mentioned, stay cool. Um, this is, is something we're going to talk about here. Again, this is part of the quadfecta of, of race execution. And, and this is really what we see uh, oftentimes is, is really manifest on the run um, is, is overheating. So uh, you have the advantage on the bike is, is you're moving uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of, of give or take around, anywhere from 15 to 25 miles an hour, uh, which is creating uh, ambient cooling moving over your body. Uh, a lot of that body heat is, is effectively getting, getting pulled away from your body. Um, but when we, we go considerably slower, once we're out there on the run course, we're also exerting more energy. Um, so the body is producing more heat and is, is not as adapt, doesn't have the advantage of that ambient cooling. So your body is going to have an increase in core temperature um, on the run. So it is really critical, uh, that we stay cool out there on the run course, which, uh, we're going to talk about that more here in just a minute. So, all right, we are, we are now to the point where we're really going to get into, to brass tacks. And this, again, this is the, the quadfecta of race execution. These are the four things, um, that I really feel like are, are critical. Uh, these are oftentimes, um, the mistakes, that athletes will make. And these are the things um, that really made me want to do this webinar is, is thinking through these um, and, and sharing this information. So uh, if you haven't heard anything to, to date, or if you're going to share this with friends, tell them, uh, skip right to this section. This is the good part. Um, so here, these four things I would say are, are the keys to, to good race execution. And it starts with, with pacing. So um, what pace should you be doing? It's really going to vary, again, based on you as an athlete, uh, the race course that you are, are doing, um, and the environment in which you are doing it. But every session that you do is an opportunity to dial in your pacing. So uh, I, I think this is a mistake that a lot of athletes make is they they simply go out and they execute their training. They do what is in their training plan. And that's fantastic. But um, they miss the opportunity to dial in their race day protocol. So that's something we're going to be talking about for all of these. The quad fact is we should be aware of each one of these, not just on race day, but in every training session that we do, we want to be cognizant of these things. We want to be dialing in. Then we want to, um, develop the proprioception of what our body feels like with each one of, of these things. So again, what pace are you doing? Um, your, your training at. And that doesn't mean that you do your, all of your training at race pace far from it. Uh, in fact, race pace is probably, uh, one of the least, uh, paces that you'll be doing. But again, it's important to dial that in, uh, during, during your training. And then, um, it is absolutely critical that we adjust the pacing for temperature and humidity, which, which combined for, for the heat index as well as elevation. Now, um, 
the temperature and humidity are going to affect far more race courses than elevation. We don't have a whole lot of courses that are at elevation, especially here um, in, in North America. Uh, Ironman Boulder comes to mind or 70.3 Boulder now uh, is, is at elevation um, off the top of my head. That's actually the only one I, I can think of. I think there's maybe another, but the vast majority are not at a, a, a level above sea level enough that that is going to affect your, your pacing simply because uh, there is less available oxygen um, at elevation. You're going to need to reduce your, your pace uh, to, to account for that. But uh, for the vast majority of, of the races for a more practical stance, um, you're going to have to factor in the temperature and, and humidity for pacing. So um, as temperature and humidity increase, Obviously, uh, we have an inverse relationship there with our pacing. The hotter it gets, the more humid it gets, the, the slower we're going to be able to, to go in, in a race day. So um, as much as we would like to deny that fact and say, I still want to push X watts or, or Y miles per minute, um, it is absolutely critical that we adjust our pacing for those conditions, um, which can be difficult to, to do. Um, so a fantastic resource for that is the RaceX app. This is a uh, partner app developed through TriDot. Um, it is independent and, and can be accessed at myracex.com. Effectively, what it's going to do is take your biometrical information, your thresholds, your course information. It's going to factor in temperature, humidity, and elevation and prescribe paces specifically for you given your fitness level, your biometrics, and the race course that you are out there racing on. So highly advise uh, checking out that uh, RaceX app at myracex.com prior to your next race and, and, and use that in developing and dialing your, your pacing protocols. Next is nutrition. So there's a lot of talk about nutrition. It's sometimes referred to as the fourth discipline uh, of, of triathlon, um, and, and it's, it's, it's known um, that it is, it is important, but I think oftentimes, um, it is, it is, uh, under acknowledged and sometimes, um, not given the care that is needed, but, uh, it, it is one of those things that can absolutely make or break your race. So adequate and proper nutrition out there on the race course is, is critical to execution. So nutrition is going to start with race week and increase in importance as race day approaches. So this is not just about what's in your bottle on race day, but again, what are you fueling your body with, uh, in those last several days? Because, uh, that, that is going to factor into, to race day, um, as well. And, and I think this kind of makes sense. I think we're all pretty cognizant of what we're putting in our bodies on, on race morning, the day before the race, uh, and then those days leading into the race. And as I said, it, it's really going to increase in importance as race day approaches. So, um, maybe if you're getting into town, you can have that cheat meal, uh, three or four days out, but, but obviously as, as race day approaches, we want to clean it up and be very cognizant of what it is that we are putting in our body. Cause it can be very advantageous to, to our performance, or it can be very, uh, deteriorating, uh, to our performance. So this is, again, this is something we want to dial in, um, in our training, be aware of what are those meals that you respond favorably to? What are those meals that you want to avoid in the days leading into the race? So again, being cognizant of what is going to set me up for a great result on race day, and then implement that into your race week strategy. Uh, nutrition is, is kind of a balancing act, uh, and, and to borrow a phrase from medicine, uh, too little is ineffective, too much is fatal. So you think about this with, with even something like, like Tylenol for a headache. Too small of a dose isn't going to do you any good. And if you absolutely uh, way overdose, it can actually be fatal. Uh, nutrition is the same. If we don't take in enough calories, we are, it's, it's going to be inadequate. It's going to be ineffective. We are not taking in enough calories to fuel our our um, output. But likewise, if we take in too much, uh, it can be uh, detrimental to our, our performance. It can uh, result in, in GI distress and other things that are going to impact our ability to, to execute on race day. So it's, it's about dialing in um, the protocol that is right for you. Uh, so how do we do that? Uh, as I mentioned before, every training session is an opportunity to dial in your execution. So uh, test and know what works for you. Uh, the biggest question here is, is how many calories per hour do you need and how many calories per hour does your body adequately tolerate? So again, 
too little is not going to fuel our body too much is going to result in GI distress and, and other things that are, are going to impede our performance. So um, every session that you do, especially those long sessions as race day approaches, be very cognizant of how many calories you're taking in per hour, how you feel. Are you feeling um, well energized or, or are you beginning to tire towards the end of those long sessions? How is your stomach? Are, are you feeling strong and good? Are you beginning to uh, have GI distress, gas pains, uh, things, things like that? Dial that in to figure out exactly how many calories an hour are, are going to, to be advantageous for you. There are some rule of thumb out there, um, but, but I don't even like to, to quote those simply because it is so individualized. Um, every athlete is different, so it's really about finding what works for you. Uh, and then next question is what form of calories are you going to be taking in? Um, a lot of this is, is personal preference, but it also can be tolerance as, as well. Uh, are you going to be taking in liquids, gels, solids, combination thereof? Again, what is your preference? What is going to be easiest for you? What is going to keep you up on your protocol and not uh, to, to get behind? What is going to be easy for you to do so that you do it? what works and what is practical. So uh, you you may love having, uh, I don't know, peanut butter sandwiches out there on the run course, but is that practical in, in race day? So find a solution uh, that works for you and is also practical. Uh, are you going to use the on-course offerings or are you going to carry your own? Um, I actually do a combination of both. Uh, my protocol for the bike is I am all liquid calories, um, and I carry my own products. Uh, I don't use the on course. I take water bottles, uh, from, from the bike aid stations, but I'm carrying my own nutrition. Once I move over to the run course, um, I utilize the, I, I like the Martin gels, uh, which are currently on course for Ironman events. So, um, I, I, I use the on course, uh, nutrition offered for the run. So again, what is that for you? Are, are, are you, um, does the Gatorade endurance that is currently offered on the bike course, does that work for you? Is that good? If so, that's fantastic because one, you don't have to buy it Two, you don't have to carry it. Uh, three, it's going to be nice and cold when they hand it to you. So, so kudos. Um, personally, I, I like uh, a different product. So, um, I carry my own out there on, on the bike. Um, and then great tip to stay up on your nutrition and hydration is to set a timer. Um, I know that, that Garmin has the ability. I'm assuming that the other products do as well. Uh, go in there. You can set separate timers for nutrition and hydration, uh, whatever it needs to be. But um, Oftentimes we get caught up uh, in, in everything that's going on. We're worrying about uh, our heart rate, our power. What is the uh, athlete next to me doing? Where are the hills? Where are the descents? All that. Uh, it's very easy to lose track of time and end up behind on your uh, nutrition protocol. So highly advise setting a timer uh, with an alert. Again, with the Garmin bike computer, it'll just pop up. And for me, I have a timer set every 10 minutes that reminds me to, to drink. So um, that's, that's again, that's what works for me. Uh, figure out what it is that, that works for you. But I do advise utilizing a timer to stay up on your nutrition protocol. All right, next is hydration. And, and this is what I've seen over the last several years really working with with a lot of athletes on this, really working on this with with my own racing and, and having this make a huge difference in my performance as well as the performance of the athletes that uh, I work with. Uh, the, the athletes that I work with will recognize this as I ask uh, on, on a very frequent basis, what is your hydration like? Are you getting in your, your uh, hydration? Are you getting in your water? Are you getting in your electrolytes? Um, because I really feel like this is perhaps the most common mistake that athletes make. Um, it's it's um, known that, that racing in the heat, you need to take in a lot of water and, and replace electrolytes. But I think oftentimes it is underestimated how much is being lost and how much is, is needed to be replaced. And then kind of on the other end, in these cooler weather races, I think it is often underestimated how much is actually lost as, as well there. Uh, they think just because it's a cool day, maybe my hydration and, and electrolyte is, is not as important. Um, but I think that is, is a mistake. Um, and something else that I've seen is, is again, I, I would say this is probably the biggest mistake made in execution. So many athletes out there 
uh, on, on the course that are not performing up to their potential um, are, are there's probably a very high correlation between uh, athletes that are underperforming and athletes that are underhydrated. So uh, for, for purposes here, um, I'm, I'm combining hydration as both your water intake and your electrolytes. So effectively that's your, your sweat. So your sweat um, in, in general terms is effectively uh, it's water and, and electrolytes. So uh, it's, it's known that we are, are losing uh, sweat, water, and electrolytes, and it is critical that we have those. Um, so we need to be replacing those. And again, I, I really feel like this is something that is critical that we nail, especially in our long course racing. So uh, first thing is knowing our sweat rate. Um, how much, how much liquid, how much, uh, are you, how much sweat are you losing on, on an hourly basis? That is going to be your sweat rate. Now, um, the easiest thing to do here is, is your, your weight test. So it's weighing before a session, it's weighing after a session, and then, um, also adding back whatever, uh, hydration you took in. So, um, if you do a, a one hour session and you, you lost two pounds and you drank one pound of water, then, then your sweat rate was, was one pound per, per hour. So it's kind of simplified, but knowing exactly what that is, but that is also specific to that environment. So obviously it's, it's kind of common sense, but, um, your sweat rate is going to vary based on the conditions, um, that you are sweating in. So, Obviously, in cool conditions, your sweat rate is going to be less than than in very hot, very humid conditions. So, um, it is critical to to know exactly uh, what your fluid loss is going to be once uh, you arrive, and what are the conditions that you're going to be racing in. So, especially if your training conditions and your racing conditions are different, you need to make sure that you are adjusting for that and taking that into consideration. Um, next is your sweat concentration. So, this is the amount of electrolyte that you're losing per liter of, of sweat. So this is going to vary, um, again, widely from athlete to athlete. It's largely based on genetics. Um, and this is actually not going to, to change, um, with the conditions. This is really going to be a, a relatively set number that you are going to lose along with, um, the, when you're losing sweat. Now this can be confused in, um, it is not to say that you are going to, um, lose a fixed amount of electrolytes per hour. You are going to lose a fixed amount of electrolytes per liter of sweat. So kind of same thing as you sweat more, you're going to be losing more electrolytes as you sweat less, you're going to be losing less electrolytes. It's, but it's, it's tied to the amount of sweat that you are, are losing. So knowing those and being able to dial in your hydration protocol, uh, is, is absolutely critical. Um, so, um, something I tell the athletes that I work with and, and something that I, I really think of on race day. And, and this is probably one of those things I've gotten a ton of great feedback from is drink like it's your job. Um, I, I live on the Texas Gulf coast. I do a lot of racing, uh, in the South. Uh, most of our races are, are in the summer months where it gets warm. Even those that push into the fall, uh, uh, uh can, can be quite warm. Um, Ironman Arizona is, is the week of, of Thanksgiving. Um, it is known to get hot. You're out there in the desert. Um, it is absolutely critical, especially given that low humidity that you are drinking like it's your job simply because it is going to be very difficult to keep up with your hydration needs when you're out there exercising for as many hours as you are racing 70.3 Arizona or Ironman Arizona in that very dry climate. Um, so, Think about that. Drink like it's your job. And the reason is blood is mostly salty water. Um, it's I, I've actually heard that that salt water can can be a substitute for blood uh, if if needed. So dehydration leads to lower and thicker blood volume. So um, as your blood is salty water, you are excreting salt and water out through your sweat. Uh, you have less blood and that blood is going to get thicker. Uh, it is effectively drying out. So because you have less blood and that blood is thicker, it is now going to be harder for the heart to pump that blood uh, so that it, it can deliver uh, oxygen to those working muscles. It can remove the metabolic waste uh, from those. So your heart is having to work harder. Your cardiovascular system is taxed um, because there's less blood and there's thicker blood. So that's going to result in a higher heart rate. This is oftentimes when we see what we refer to as cardiac drift or decoupling, where you are holding a steady 
intensity level, but your heart rate begins to, to drift away and increase. Oftentimes that is a result uh, of dehydration. So the cardiovascular system is having to work harder to produce the same effort level. So there's an inverse there. So uh, with hydration, too little um, results in a drastic reduction in performance. Uh, there are illnesses associated with it. Um, and then hyponatremia. Now that is, is specific to the electrolyte side. So if you're taking in too much water and not enough electrolytes, you can, you can end up with hyponatremia. And, and there are several other bad things that happen when we don't take in enough um, hydration. Take in too much, um, kind of as a rule, high level, worst case, you sweat it out uh, or, or you pee it out. So um, it's, we definitely want to err on the side of too much um, because the, the effects of, of, of too much are, are much more manageable um, than, than too little. So um, just a little plug here. Um, I, I've mentioned the products that I use. Uh, I, I want to plug precision fuel and hydration. Um, this, this webinar is in no way associated with these guys. Uh, they have not paid for this. They don't even know that uh, I was including this um, in the webinar, but I, I really believe in these products. I recommend them uh, at least uh, to, to try to all the athletes that, that I work with. Um, simply because they've made a big difference in, in my race execution. So um, they make great products, but they also have amazing resources. And, and I, I just mentioned the necessity to dial in your uh, nutrition protocol, your hydration electrolyte protocols, that can be difficult. They have some great free resources available on their website. They have an individualized fuel and hydration plan. So you go through and you answer questions and it is going to produce for you um, a guide as to how many calories an hour that you're gonna need, how many ounces of water you're gonna need, how many milligrams of electrolytes you're gonna need. This is a great resource that can give you a, a huge, huge, huge head start in dialing in your nutrition and hydration protocols. Um, they also offer a free video consult that is going to take it to the next level. Uh, this is where I got uh, the tip for that Go Bottle in transition. Um, that call was was well worth the the, the amount that I didn't pay because it was free. But but again, that's been a huge tip for me, and I've been able to pass that on to to a lot of athletes. So definitely recommend checking out Precision Fuel and Hydration online resources, the free video consult, and um, try out their products. Uh, they they work fantastic for me. I've gotten a lot of good feedback from the athletes I work with. Um, so I, I would say, to, again, uh, not meant to be a commercial, but this is just, um, again, based on my own personal experience, I'm a big fan of, of these products. And I really feel like it fills a niche that, um, is, is underserved. Yeah. There are a lot of options when it comes to nutrition, hydration, but I feel like precision fuel and hydration is, is a little bit different approach, which I, which I really like and has been, um, great for me. All right, and on to the final uh, aspect of the quadfecta of race execution, and that is cooling. And I will say this is often overlooked. Um, maintaining a, a staying cool is not just about staying comfortable. Yes, when, when we get hot, it's very uncomfortable. We feel a lot better when we're cool, but um, there, there is a critical component to, to our race execution in maintaining a low uh, or, or acceptable uh, core temperature. So the body will protect itself. Um, as the core temperature begins to rise, um, there are bad things that can happen to our body when our core temperature gets too high. It's, it's, it's the same thing as having a very high fever. Bad things happen when our core temperatures get too high. So the body is going to protect itself. It is not going to allow itself to get to an internal temperature that is going to do damage to itself. So as your core temperature begins to increase, your body is going to begin to limit the amount of output that you are capable of. So there's going to be an inverse relationship between that increase in core temperature and your performance. So it is critical that we maintain our core temperature. And it starts as early as the swim. Now, this isn't the case for, for every race, but there are certain instances where this needs to be taken into consideration. Namely, if you are racing, uh, say it's a wetsuit legal swim, and you are racing in a warm environment, then keep that in mind. Your body temperature is going to increase throughout that swim if you're wearing a wetsuit. You're going to come out of that swim with a higher body temperature than if you didn't wear the wetsuit. And if you are coming out onto a warm environment, 
then your body temperature is already going to be that much elevated. Now, um, that isn't to say you shouldn't wear a wetsuit or you shouldn't wear a wetsuit when, when racing warm weather races. It's just something to take into consideration. How warm is the water? Um, how, how much are you going to be affected by that temperature once you, you exit the water? Uh, do you have a sleeveless option? Uh, things like that. Just simply take it into consideration. Cold weather, cold water, cold air, obviously, you know, stay warm. Um, but, but as you begin to, to kind of approach those, those margins, at least take this into consideration and know that you can overheat on the swim. And once that core temperature begins to elevate, it is more and more difficult to, to get it back down. That is why we, we say more so on the run, because you've been exercising for all these hours, your core temperature has been increasing for all these hours. So it's really going to manifest on the run. So uh, that, that's why we say it starts as early as the swim. Uh, so it is critical to stay cool on the bike. Um, so a, 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 I often say a, a cold bike sets up a cool, comfortable run. A comfortable run is going to be a hot, uh, excuse me, a comfortable bike is going to be a hot run. So um, the weather obviously plays into that uh, big part, but also what are the cooling protocols that you're doing out there on the bike? And, and my tip there is to always take cold bottles from the aid station. So um, if you are utilizing um, the on-course nutrition, um, I don't care if you haven't taken a single sip out of the last bottle you had, hopefully you have, <laughs> um, but if you have uh, say half a bottle left, go ahead and ditch that in, in that trash zone and always take a cold bottle. Um, so that you are getting down the, the, the cool, um, the cool fluids, which is going to help keep your body cool. So then even if you're not, uh, utilizing that on course nutrition, like, like what I do, um, I always will take a cold water bottle, um, from, from that aid station. So what I will do when I go through that aid station, generally, um, the, the first thing that is offered is a water bottle. Um, so I will go through and I will attempt to get one of those first water bottles as I'm going through that aid station. First thing I'm going to do is take a big draw on that. I'm going to drink down as much of that cold water as I can. So one, I'm staying up on my hydration. Um, and two, I am looking to cool my, my temperature, uh, internally. So by taking in those cool fluids, it is going to cool my body temperature. Um, from there, I'm going to spray my face, my, my helmet, my kit, get as much of my body wet with that cold water as possible. Now, obviously the conditions of the race are, are going to dictate how much, um, may, maybe my, my external, uh, temperature is, is cool and I don't need that, but always taking in the, the cool to, to, um, address the core temperature from the inside. So, um, from there, uh, it's, it's chug spray. I'll probably chug again, maybe spray again. If there I'm attempting or, or approaching the, the backside of that aid station, I may grab another, uh, cold water bottle as I am exiting. So, um, again, always take those cold water bottle and look to cool your body, both from the external and internal approach. Uh, cold fluids are also going to be more palatable. Um, you're, you're likely to run into some flavor fatigue, especially late, uh, in the race, especially if you're, you're utilizing that, um, on course nutrition, you've had a whole lot of it for all these hours, taking that cold bottle later in the bike ride is going to, um, help you stay up on your protocol and continue to take it in when, when maybe your palate is saying like, can we do something else? Or I'm tired of this flavor. Um, when it's cold, it's going to be more palatable. So you're more likely to take it in. As mentioned, um, the, the cooling or lack thereof is is going to manifest mostly on the run, um, both from the the uh, time approach, the uh, accumulation, increasing that body heat throughout, as well as um, here we're working the hardest. Uh, the, we're we're in the time of day uh, where the temperatures are the highest, um, and so that is really where we're going to see this. So again, I would argue. Um, that there is a very high correlation of people out there on that run course who are underperforming that are underhydrated and their core temperature is high. They may not even realize it. They may not even feel that hot. Um, I've actually been quite surprised to learn what, what temperatures are comfortable and what are not out there um, on the course. So I would say this is something that is absolutely critical and often neglected, but I would say very, very common out there on the course. 
Oftentimes we see those athletes that have a lot of race potential. They are very fit. They trained properly. They trained adequately, but they have simply not taken in enough hydration and electrolytes and they've allowed their core temperature to get too high. Um, and therefore they are not out there performing up to their potential on the run course. So I think this is one of those things that is absolutely critical that you, you dial in. Um, so, uh, what can we do? Consider your gear. Um, so if you're out there on a sunny course with not a lot of shade, cap, visor, covering as much skin as possible, um, and then taking advantage of those aid stations. Like I said earlier, taking something from every aid station, whether that be um, ice or cold water or both, um, pouring the cold water uh, all over your body, over your head, um, pouring ice down your kit, um, under your cap down your crotch. Those are um, particularly advantageous locations. There's a lot of blood vessels uh, in those areas, which can help manage the temperature, um, e even in the palms of your hands. So this is something I will do. Uh, once I've gone through that aid station and, and done everything I'm going to do, I will um, take the last couple of pieces of ice and just run with those in, in my fist and allow them to melt. Uh, usually, it's kind of surprisingly, a lot of times they'll, they'll last um, pretty close to that next aid station. Um, so again, it, it lets me feel cool. Um, if my hands are cold, I've got that ice in my palms, um, I feel cooler. So there's a little bit of, of trickery um, as well, but there's also a lot of blood vessels in the hands that are helping to um, lower the temperature of the blood, which then lowers the temperature of, of the core. And then you can always rally after dark. That's something that... Um, Again, I see a lot. It, it, this would be exclusively to Ironman racing. A lot of times these athletes get behind on hydration. They get overheated, so they're walking out there in the afternoon. Once that sun begins to set, temperatures begin to drop. Um, that is an opportunity to, to rally. So, so if that um, happens to, to you or someone you see out there on the course, encourage them to, to hydrate, get caught up on their hydration. And, and once that temperature begins to drop as the sun goes down, then they can rally and uh, get to that finish line as quickly as possible. Uh, something I am very excited about, um, something that the Norwegians are, are utilizing. Um, so this is something that, that is, is obviously we've known this for a long time, but we're getting better with, with our technology and quantifications and, and, and data around this. Um, the core body temperature sensor effectively um, is a, a wearable device that is going to give you real-time measurements of your core temperature. So this can really be a game changer. Um, so you know exactly what your core temperature is, and then you can modify your, your, um, your protocols appropriately. Maybe it's backing off the pace. Maybe it's taking in more cold fluids, all of those things are, or if you're under, then maybe you can push a little bit more, but it's, um, very beneficial, very advantageous to have that objective data there. Um, so again, I'm not associated with those guys in any way. Um, I was just very, very excited to, to see this product. And, um, I, I believe this can be something that can really, um, lead to, to change in execution going forward. All right, so we're getting close to the end and and, and no surprise to me, I'm, I'm over on my time, just really excited about all this stuff, but just a few few things here as we wrap up. I wanna recommend getting in race rehearsals. So race rehearsals duplicate race conditions as best you can. Your best case scenario is to go and actually do these on the course, but vast majority won't have the opportunity. So it's how can you replicate the course, um, whether it's on your, your local routes, maybe it's using a virtual app, um, something like that. But what we want to do is get into as close as full distance bike as possible. So 56, if you're doing a 70.3, 112 at Ironman, and then doing a, a longer run off the bike. So somewhere between 40 and 60 minute run off the bike. And we want to test everything. So this is going to include your gear. So what kit are you wearing on race day? Um, what helmet uh, what, uh, what running shoes, which cap, what, what are those things you're going to use on race day? Don't let race day be the first time you test something out. That's what these race rehearsals are for. And then we're going to dial in all of these, uh, the, these quad factors, our pacing, nutrition, hydration, and cooling. What is it that you're going to do on race day? Test it in this race rehearsal. And we're going to see what went right. What wasn't perfect. We're going to, uh, adjust and then test again. So whatever we didn't we didn't love, whatever wasn't working perfectly, we're going to make adjustments and then do a second race rehearsal. Um, so the suggestion is to do these four weeks and two weeks out from from race day. So this is probably the last big um, brick session that you're going to have uh, as race day approaches. And then once you have done these two race rehearsals, 
you have gone in and you have uh, tested your protocols, you have refined your protocols and tested them again, you're now able to head into race day with a well-vetted plan in a high level of confidence, knowing that your gear, your pacing, your nutrition, your hydration, your cooling protocols are all on point and going to um, help you produce amazing results. And then finally, as we head to the finish line, again, I'd be remiss not to give you a few tips. This is the magic place. This is my happy place. It's probably your happy place as well. So just a couple tips as you approach that finish line, as you step onto that red carpet, clean up, um, get ready for those pictures, take it all in. Um, this this is, is uh, oftentimes I'll see athletes that, that kind of miss it. Maybe you're a little bit out of it, but uh, man, just take a second to look around to hear the crowd, hear the announcer, really enjoy the finish line. This is what you've worked so hard for. This is is what you've earned. Really enjoy um, that finish line. Plan your finish. If you're one that uh, likes to to do uh, hand gestures or something like that, uh, have fun at that finish. Find some space. Um, so if, if you're, if that finishing shoot is crowded, maybe just hang back a little bit, um, and and take that in. Or if you've made a friend out there and you guys ran the last 20 miles together, uh, maybe share that experience with that person, but, uh, do it is. And then for me, it's all the high fives. That's definitely a highlight of racing long course is headed down that finishing shoot, uh, giving high fives to, uh, my support crew, spectators, kids, all that really enjoy, uh, that finish line. So hopefully, Um, based on everything we've shared here this evening, I I really hope that uh, this enables you to have some amazing finish lines. You arrive at that finish line faster than you ever have, feeling better than you ever have. So again, that is my objective based on everything that we've discussed here this morning. So, uh, excuse me, this evening, I don't even know what time it is now um, as I've I've gone so long. Um, So uh, again, I hope everything has been beneficial for you. Uh, Any questions that you have, feel free to reach out to me. My email is john at tribetriathlon.net. We've got some super cool camps uh, coming up. You can check those out at tribetriathloncamps.com. We've got them coming up uh, in Waco, Arizona, as well as several others in the works. So we hope you will join us uh, for those. So, uh, thank you once again for your time here this evening. I hope this has been beneficial and enjoyable, uh, for you. Good luck. And I hope to see you guys all out at the races.